We've been doing a little series called The Abundant Life. And the reason we've been doing that series, as most of you know, I tend to go through the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But right now, I've decided to break it up a little bit and do this little mini-series called The Abundant Life because I wanted to focus in on some details. And just to kind of give you a preview of where we are going, basically what I'm going to do today is I'm kind of more or less going to sum up what we've talked about for the last month. That's really what I'm doing, add a little more detail to it. Does that, that make sense? Next, next week, I'm going to give you some principles. Next Sunday, I'm going to give you some principles from God's Word on how to have a fantastic marriage. Now, if you already have a fantastic marriage, you still want to show up because it'll be even more fantastic when you're done. Now, if you have a rotten marriage, you definitely need to be here because I'm going to tell you what God's Word says about how to fix that. Now, if you're not married, but you ever want to be married, you need to be here. So I could teach you how to be a good wife before you become a wife or a good husband before you become one. Now, if you never want to get married, you're weird. (laughs) But we still love you. And these principles will help you because you know what? You are the bride of Christ. Does that make sense? If you're a Christian, you are the bride of Christ. So that means that next Sunday applies to everybody. Isn't that great? And then the week after that, I'm going to teach you how to pray. You know why I'm going to teach you how to pray? Because the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. They wanted to know, and we're supposed to be a church that follows the, the, you know, we're apostolic authority is what we call it. We're under the authority of the apostles as written in the New Testament. And so if they wanted to learn how to pray, we need to learn how to pray. We don't want to assume you know. So we're going to teach you that. Then we have Easter Sunday, and I'm going to give you all kinds of science and history and why the resurrection is really true and all that sort of stuff. It'll be fun. Then we'll get back to Genesis. That's my plan. But in the meantime, we're going to be finishing off this series called The Abundant Life. And I got to thinking, how am I going to start this off? The Abundant Life. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. And too many of us are missing it. We're not experiencing an abundant life. And worse, there are plenty of teachers out there that their idea of an abundant life is the same as the world's. Isn't that right? They're going to teach you that, hey, being a Christian means being rich, being healthy, having all your hair, all that sort of thing, and you're supposed to be healthy and wealthy and all that. But it's not true. It's not true. The abundant life is having life and having the power to transcend no matter what life throws at you. Because even the best of us are going to face hard times. We are. So I wanted to give you some of those principles. And I got to thinking about why you should listen to this message. There are people in this room. Do not raise your hand. There are people in this room that have been playing the Christian game for a long time. You've been playing the game. And I'm going to be talking to you today. I'm not trying to put guilt on you, but I want you to think about this for a second. You've been playing the game. You've got a form of godliness, but you've denied its power, and it's not transforming you, and you know it. The abundant life, what is that? Bill Cosby said, you know, it's funny that that people... In the world, what they want to do is they want to go out and they want to have a good time. They think that going out and having fun, that is the abundant life. That's a fulfilling life. So they get up on a Friday night and they put on a nice suit and they go out to some nice restaurant, some bar, and they decide to start drinking because that's what they're supposed to do to have fun. And by the time you get to the end of the evening, you find yourself in the bathroom in a place, with your face in a place that was never built for your face. This is not the abundant life. I think Bill is right. I don't think that's the abundant life. But you see, the world's driving force, your whole culture, all you have to do is sit and watch commercials long enough, says that the abundant life is being young, parties, lots of beer, And that's the abundant life. How many of you know it ain't so? 
It's not true. And the rest of the world has this, this, this driving philosophy. In fact, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be straight with you. When I was a public school teacher, of course, I had to take classes on how to be a teacher. We're going to learn educational philosophy. And we had to study this guy here. His name is Abraham Maslow. Not that guy. This guy. Now, Abraham Maslow was a psychologist, and he was the modern guru. This guy was the one that basically laid out how educational philosophy should be in the American public school system. Now, of course, he's an atheist and a Marxist, so what we're going to do is we're going to end up with what he calls the hierarchy of needs. We had to memorize this stuff because I'm dealing with my elementary school kids, and I know because Abraham told me that the highest form of of attainment that a child, that a human being can reach is what's called self-actualization. This is the top of the hierarchy of needs. And here's his quote on what is self-actualization. This is reaching the point where the desire for your self-fulfillment is reached. The desire to become more and more whatever you are, to become everything that you are capable of becoming. In other words, the highest form of fulfillment is just getting whatever you want. The highest form of, of, of philosophy in the world today is that when you reach a point of total self-absorption, total self-centeredness, you have achieved, achieved philosophical nirvana according to the public school system across the street. And that's the truth. Self-absorption. That's what this guy thinks. But you know what the truth is? Even though they say these things out loud, even the world knows that just getting whatever you want does not lead to an abundant life. It doesn't fulfill. And we as Christians, even though we say we know that, we still are going after all the things that the world says, this will satisfy, this will make it make you happy. There are plenty of Christians that still fall into these traps. But I have news for you. Take a look at some of these guys here. The truth is that people have gone out and they have sought some of these things. They have gone out and they have decided. This is Voltaire. Voltaire decided that the, the, where I'm going to find fulfillment is if I have no rules at all. No morals at all. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And in the end, this is a quote from Voltaire. He said on his deathbed, I wish I had never been born. The agony and the depression that he fell into at the end. And how about Lord Byron? Lord Byron sought after pleasure. He decided that I am going to do whatever, like Voltaire, I'm going to do whatever I want, but I'm going to take it to a different level. If it's fun, I'm going to do it. And he went after that his whole life. And in the end, on his deathbed, he said, and I quote, the worm, the canker, and grief are mine alone. How about Jay Gould? Jay Gould decided the secret to joy and fulfillment in life is to seek wealth. He became one of the richest men in history. He had wealth beyond your wildest imaginations. If we were to take him today and take the amount of money he had and put it into today's dollars, he would make Bill Gates look like a poor person. This guy had wealth beyond your wildest imagination. And he said, in the end, and I quote, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. That's what he said. How about fame? Lord Beaconsfield said, okay, maybe it's not wealth. Maybe it's not money. Uh, or, uh, maybe it's not pleasure. Maybe it's just fame. I'll be incredibly well known. And in his day, he was the most famous person alive. You don't even know him today. But in his day, he was the most famous person around. And here's what he said in the end. Youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle, and old age is just my regret. Or how about Alexander the Great? Alexander the Great did it all. Not only was he wealthy and powerful and Denied himself no pleasure, he decided that what I will do is I will simply become the most powerful man in the world. And he did. Undefeated. Everywhere he went, his armies were victorious. 
And at the end of a battle, major battle, Alexander fell down and wept, cried out, there are no more worlds to conquer. Went out and got himself stone drunk and died in his own vomit. So what have we learned here? We didn't need to go after Voltaire's no rules or, or Lord Byron's pleasure or Jay Gould's money. We did not need to seek fame like Lord Beaconsfield. We did not need to go after military glory like Alexander because the truth is it's right in the Bible all along. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 10 says it as clear as day. Anything I wanted, I took. I did not restrain myself from any joy. I even found great pleasure in hard work and additional reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all meaningless. It was like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Now, there are many people here We've never achieved great fame, great military glory, great wealth. But we all secretly think that if I just had what those men had, then I would be fulfilled. I would find the abundant life. No, you won't. They proved you won't. They proved it. Solomon proved it. You do not need to seek those things. But here's the, here's, here's the rub. There are many people that know in their heart, okay, Pat, I've heard it. I've come to your church. If all of these things don't satisfy, what will? And you give me this trite answer. You say Jesus is the answer. But you're not really telling me how he's the answer. Today, I'm going to show you how. But before we get there, you need to make up your mind. You need to decide if I'm right, if Solomon's right, if Voltaire is right. Because in your heart, you haven't really given Jesus the absolute lordship of your life. You play with it. It's a little bit of a religious game. You do it because it makes your wife happy. You do it because it makes your husband happy. You do it because, well, good morals are a smart thing to have. But your life is unfulfilled. There's an emptiness in there, and you cannot get it filled. You may even call yourself a Christian, but you have never, from your heart, said, you are my Lord. And until that day, that unfulfillment is like, it's like a cancer inside of you. It's going to eat you alive. It will. Absolutely will. That's the center of what it is that we teach here. Look, be honest with yourself. If sex, ooh, I said the big word. Everybody went, what's he going to talk about next? If sex is so wonderful, and if it's so fulfilling, because how many of you know all you have to do is read Cosmopolitan magazine and you know that the ultimate of everything is sex, right? If that is so wonderful, then the happiest, most fulfilled people in the world should be prostitutes. I mean, they get paid for it. I mean, they make money. But they're not. How about alcohol? We see all the, we see all the commercials, don't we? Oh, that's where the fulfillment is. The parties and the alcohol, that's where it is. If that's true, then why is it that the happiest, most fulfilled people in the world are not alcoholics? They should be. They're just sucking it down. But for some reason, they're not fulfilled. Are you following where I'm going with this? Romance, ambition, position, all the things the world says this will fulfill you will not. There is no abundant life in that. Now, the, I said the trite answer, the quick answer is Jesus is the answer, right? We've heard that before. But now we need to make it a little more practical. Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the truth that you're looking for. I'm the life that you are missing. That's why we named this church 14.6, because that is John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to God. No one gets to that fulfillment. No one is going to find what they're missing except through me. I'm the only way. I'm the only way. Now, the first thing we need to understand about this is that we're not talking about a myth. 
We're not talking about something that's a hallucination or something of that nature. The people that wrote what I just said, John, chapter 14, was written by a guy named John. (laughs) He was there. He was an eyewitness. When we talk about Jesus Christ and what he said, we're talking about a real person in real history that we can place there. Does that make sense? It would be like me telling you that Ronald Reagan said this, and I was there, and I heard it. You could take it to the bank. John was there. He was there. He was an eyewitness of these things. He saw Jesus. He heard Jesus. He handled Jesus. The truth of the matter is, is he wrote down what Jesus said because Jesus said, I am the way. I am the one that's going to give you the fulfillment that you were looking for. And how many of you know that they were looking for it then, just like they're looking for it now? People haven't changed. The disciples were just people like you. Struggling along. They were religious people. They knew the Bible inside out. I'm willing to bet they know it better than you. Because they memorized most of the Old Testament. You're lucky if you know John 3.16. They got you beat when it comes to religion. And they didn't find it in religion either. And Jesus said, yeah, you're not going to find it in your rituals. you got to find it in a genuine, one-on-one, real, from-your-heart relationship with me. And until you get to that place, you will never find what you are looking for. So what I want to do is, I said we're going to sum up a little bit what we've been talking about the last four weeks. And the the first part of this series, I said, a life that works. Well, Jesus is what's going to give you a life that works. You remember that? I talked about that back then. Well, I want to I want to kind of revisit that point just for a minute. Go to First John chapter one. First John chapter one. It's towards the end of your Bible. Right before Revelation, there's three little letters written by John when he was an old man. Now, John had been around for a while. He was a witness. He wrote down what Jesus said in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John had been spreading all over the place, had been copying it down. He was still alive. He'd gone through a lot. John had gone through a lot. He was the last of them. Of of the 12, the rest of them had all been killed because of their faith in Christ. Did you know that? Some of them had been tortured and, 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 and driven through with spears and heads cut off and some of them crucified, one of them crucified upside down. John's an old man. He himself had literally been boiled in oil, but he didn't die. He survived somehow. And an old man all crippled up. They called him John the Beloved because he was the most loving man anyone had ever met. Even after all of that, Because he said, I found the abundant life. It doesn't matter what happens to me. I could be boiled in oil. I have found my fulfillment in Jesus. It doesn't matter what you do to me. I've got a fulfillment that goes greater than anything. I don't need money. I don't need fame. I don't need a house. I don't need anything because I've got him. It's all I need. And this is what he wrote in this letter. 1 John chapter 1. Verse 1, he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Life. The life appeared. Life. That's what we want, isn't it? He's saying the word of life, the truth of what will make your life fulfilled is right there. I was there. I saw it. I touched it. I felt it. I heard it. And I'm proclaiming it to you. And he's saying this life, it appeared. We've seen it. We testify to it. We proclaim to you this eternal life, which was with the Father, which was with God, and has appeared to us. Isn't that powerful? John is saying, look, I heard Jesus. I saw his miracles. I considered it. I looked at it carefully. I have studied it out. And I've been willing to put my life on the line to tell you about it. And all my friends are dead because they also were willing to say, I was there. I don't care how much you torture me. You could chop off my arms. It's not going to make me turn around and say I didn't see it because I saw it. Does that make sense? I mean, think about this for a second. How many of you know people will die for a lie? But not very many people will know something is not true and still die for it. I mean, would you do that? I mean, you know it's not true. 
would you still give your life for it? Of course not. I mean, if you're in it for the money, I mean, people say all the time, oh, well, I think they started this religion because they wanted to make money. They wanted to get fame. They wanted to get the girls, whatever it happens to be. Okay, let's say for just, just for the sake of argument that those 12 guys, they made Jesus up and they decided we're going to start this religion and we're going to make some bank. Right? Then why did they give their lives, all of them? Except for this guy, and he was willing. I mean, he got boiled in oil. I mean, how much more do you want? No, I saw it. I was there. My friends, the Romans came and said, if you tell us that it's not true, if you stand up in front of this great big crowd and say it's not true, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Jesus isn't God in the flesh. Just say that, and we won't burn you alive. And they said, I can't. I was there. I saw it. Jesus rose from the dead. I was there. Burn me if you want. I know where the abundant life is. And I'm going to be with him. It's the worst you could do to me. Do you want that? Do you want a power so deep, so powerful, so overwhelming, so transforming that you can stare death in the eye and go, nothing to me. I have my abundant life in him. And when I check out of this world, because one way or another, nobody gets out of this alive. My master will give me an eternal life in a place called heaven. I've already got my abundant life. I don't need what this world has to offer. And when you don't need what this world has to offer, are you anxious about anything? You want to be stress-free? This is how to be stress-free. Because you just don't care. You don't give a rip. So what? So we're broke. Big deal. We'll shoot some rabbits. I mean, we're fine. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? There's lots of rabbits in this town. I mean, we just don't worry about it because we're not anxious. We're not afraid. Oh, <gasps> my house is not as nice as hers. So what? You don't care because I've got my life in Jesus. And see, that's the first key. We need to, we need to get this. We need to nail this. The abundant life begins when we recognize that Jesus is really God. You got to get that. You got to make up your mind. You got to get past religion. You got to get past, I go to church because it makes other people happy. Instead, you got to go, I get it. It's real. Jesus is really God in the flesh. Let's go on from there. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. It says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. We write this to make our joy complete. So what John is saying here. He's saying the reason that we're telling you that we're eyewitnesses, the reason that we're willing to be crucified upside down in order to tell you that Jesus rose from the dead, the reason we're willing to be boiled in oil to make sure that down through the centuries, people in faraway places we've never heard of, in languages we don't speak, will hear the message that Jesus is real, that he's God in the flesh, that he died on a cross, that he rose again from the grave. We have an incredible joy in telling you this. And we tell you this so that you can have fellowship with us. Do you see that? Fellowship, what's that? The Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. Koinonia means setting aside of private interests and desires, and the joining in with others for a common purpose. In other words, koinonia is a whole lot deeper than showing up at the movies. I mean, you could go to a crowd. I've been to a couple of U2 concerts with my friend Louie because U2 is just cool. Okay, but we know that. You know that. So we go to a U2 concert. I have never met Bono. I have never met The Edge. But when I'm sitting in that concert, I have a connection, don't I? I feel it. And so does the other 100,000 people around me. And we are having a great time. But it lasts for how long? A couple hours? It costs me a lot of money? That's not koinonia. 
That's being in the crowd. Do you see the difference? I may love their music and I may even connect with what they're saying in those words. Feel it, even emotionally. But I don't have a relationship with those guys on the stage, do I? I don't have a relationship, I mean, other than me and Louie and everybody else around us, and hey, we're all U2 fans, but other than that, what do we have? Nothing. No, he's saying, look, when we proclaim to you that Jesus is God, and when you accept that, we do that so that you can have something a whole lot deeper. You want an abundant life, you need to learn to connect with us. Koinonia means something much deeper. It's a deeper kind of friendship. It's, it, it's a relationship, guys, that requires an investment. And we've lost that. Too many churches have become a great big U2 concert. Now, there's nothing wrong with the production. We work at it. There's nothing wrong with, with playing good music and practicing. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having, having technology. Nothing wrong with any of those things. Those are good things, important things. But that's not what church is supposed to be. No, 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 no. This is supposed to be a family. Much different. We like our little ones. It's supposed to be, hi. We're supposed to be a family. It's supposed to be something deeper. See, some people try to live the Christian life all by themselves. Me and Jesus. Now, how many of you know how wolves and how lions are going to tear down their prey? They isolate someone from the herd. That's the one they kill. So these people that get out there and go, well, you know, I'm not really part of the church, you know, because you just don't like the organized religion thing, you know. Well, you know what? You're the one that's going to get isolated and eaten. You're going to be Satan's lunch. Not me, because I have a relationship with him and with her and with him and with him. I've invested in your life. You've invested in mine. You've invested in me. I was there when you were baptized. Right? That creates something. That creates family. Family's big. How many of you know that family can be annoying? I mean, just think about your brother, okay, <laughs> or your sister, or, or your cousin. <laughs> I got lots of cousins, and some of them, uh, I, you know, Dennis is my witness on this. He's a cousin of mine, and we got some cousins that, you know, it's like, okay, we don't talk about them. <laughs> but you know what? They show up at the Christmas party, and when I'm ever able to get up there, I haven't been there in 10 years, but when I do... You know, it's, it's family, right? We put up with them. We got the atheist uncle, don't we? Still love the guy. You know what I mean? Because he's family. Family is something you invest in, and it's deeper. You want the abundant life? Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. They, he didn't say, they will know you're my disciples because you had a great big crowd, and then you all left, and nobody knows everybody. Did he say that? Koinonia. We have a membership class here at this church today. And if, this, if you haven't yet decided if this is going to be the place where you're going to find Koinonia, maybe it's another church. That's cool. Just get yourself connected. Because if you don't get connected, you are the animal that gets chucked out of the herd and the lion is going to eat you. It's one thing to go around and church, look for a church. I get that. We have to do that. We move, get new jobs. Maybe something happens at the church and you got to go. Maybe they start teaching something weird. I don't know. We don't teach weird things. We teach the Bible. So relax. But if you want to know what it is we believe and teach, you show up after this meeting and we will tell you. And then you can join and become a part of this fellowship. That's what John is saying here. He's saying... When we have a mutual connection, a knowing and a growing and an obeying together, that makes our joy complete. You want the abundant life? You got to get connected. Too many people are just a face in the crowd. And they've got good reasons for it, even great reasons, even, I mean, excuses that are almost hard to, to deal with. 
I mean, I work on this day, or, or I, just, I just can't get involved, or I've got this too much baggage on this and that and everything. It, it's nonsense. I assure you, you do not have as much baggage as I have. I've got a past that if you knew it, you wouldn't listen to me because of some of the places I've been. There's nothing you have been through that would shock me. And I love you. Why? Because my master loved me so much he saved me from that place. Pulled me out of the dark. Gave me his own life. And because he loved me, I love you and I want to connect with you. And I'm not the only one. You want to connect with some of these people? How about you? You got two more friends right here. You need some friends? Here we go. You need to connect. That's the key. Take a look at it. The abundant life builds. You want to see it build? You want to see it grow? You got to invest. You got to invest in relationships with other Christians. If you don't, you're wasting your time. So the first thing is you got to know that God is God and that you're going to make him your God and that's it. That we're, in, we're done with the discussion. We're done with the war. You are the king. And the second is to go, if you're the king, you said I got to love the rest of this kingdom. That's what you said. They will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. I got to have some others to love. So I better connect. Let's go on. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. This is the message. Okay. We heard it. We saw it. We know where the real life is. We want to have fellowship with you in, in this. And here's the message. And you look at this message and you go, that seems pretty simple. Did I have to come to get up early to hear God is light? I mean, kind of knew that. But let's think about this for a second. He's saying, if you want real joy, if you want real fulfillment, if you want real intimacy with God, a relationship that's real, if you want real intimacy with other Christians, that koinonia thing, he's saying, look, we heard it directly from Jesus, from God himself, and I'm telling you, he is light. What does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? we got to understand something about God from that very simple, simple statement. It tells us that God is absolutely 100% and in every other way, holy. He is pure like light. There can be no darkness in his presence because light drives out darkness. I've said this before. At night, if you open up the door to your house, the dark doesn't bleed in the light goes out. Now what does this mean for you and for me? Well, I tell this story to illustrate the idea of you can't find your way in the dark. Once upon a time, when I was a kid, I lived on an island in Canada. This island was about 700,000 miles from the nearest electric light bulb. I mean, okay, maybe not that far, but it was a long ways from the nearest electric light bulb. I mean, it was a long ways. It took us several days to get there. We're in a logging camp, and I did not, coming from California and San Diego, I didn't understand the concept of dark until I got there. Because that's dark, dark. I mean, we think of dark, and you go outside, it's not dark. There's lights all over the place. You get there, and there's not an electric light bulb for however many millions of miles, and, and you're standing around going, there's lions and tigers and bears out in these woods. And I'm alone, and it's dark. Here's what my dad did. I had a big fear of the dark. I didn't like the dark very much. So here we are. We had this cabin, and we had an electric generator that runs off gasoline in order to run the three light bulbs that we had. Okay, and you know, when the generator is going, I'm happy. Nice, loud sounds. Okay, light. And my dad made me turn off the generator. Now, that sounds easy until you recognize that it's 100 yards away from the cabin itself behind a great big log. Now, when I say a big log, log like this. You had to go around behind the log to turn it off. And when you turn it off, it's instant velvet black everywhere. And you got to find your way back. I used to try to run 
from the generator and beat the light. I mean, you can't run as fast as the speed of light. I tried. It just doesn't work. And you've got to creep through 120 yards of forest. You know there's lions out there, mountain lions. You know there are bears. You see them every day, and you know they want to eat you. I like light. Light shows me where to go. Make sense? And he's saying God is light. There's no darkness in him at all. In other words, listen to what he's trying to say here. You need God's light to tell you which way to go. We too often look at our religion as a side order in our life. We show up once a week. He's saying, no, 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 you don't get it. God is your light. That's it. Everything else is dark. Everything. Your philosophy, your ideas about how you should live. I mean, the number of people that come up to me. I mean, I had a counseling appointment just last week uh, with somebody. They're, they're not members of this church. They, they want a pastor to help them in their relationship. Okay, so they come in. And the first thing they want to tell me is why they don't believe that God can tell them how to have a good marriage. And you want to come into my office? You're going to hear something different from me because God is light. They don't want to hear it. A lot of people don't want to hear it. Even people who call themselves Christians, I'll say, well, they come into my office, they're having this problem, and I say, well, the Bible says this, and they go, well, yeah, yeah. But this, but that. Listen, you have got to understand that God is the light. And where does his light come from? His light is his direction. Isn't that right? It tells you how to live. It tells you what to do. It tells you where to go. This light you desperately need because everything else is darkness. And just listen, guys, the light from God doesn't come from nice feelings. I was talking to somebody who's not a Christian the other day. Well, I pray to God all the time. He's my friend. And I get feelings, and that tells me where to go. That's not the direction that God gives. It's not from feelings. It's not from we sat around and chanted over a crystal for a while, and we felt like going this way. No, you just have indigestion. Okay, that's not God's light. Where's God's light, guys? It's in his word. And this is what is being spoken to us. This is what we are hearing. John is trying to say, and and listen, Psalm 119, verse 105 says this, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You gotta be in the word. You gotta be in the word. Let me say it again. You gotta be in the word. 80% of the people who call themselves Christians have never read the Bible. They've never read it. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. The vast majority of you have never read them. You don't know what Nahum chapter 1 says. You don't know what's in the book of Habakkuk. You didn't even know there was a book of Habakkuk. There is. How about Obadiah? Did you know it only has one chapter? Most people don't know that. Now, look, I'm not trying to spout off my knowledge. I'm trying to say, get that knowledge. Know his word. But we don't. It's supposed to be the lamp to to our feet, the light to our path, but we don't even know what it says. We've never read it. And even if we do read it, how many of you know if you read 1,189 chapters, you're probably going to have to read it again because you're going to miss a few things. My grandfather read through the Bible cover to cover, no less than 50 times in his life. 50 times. And Dennis and I would go over to Grandpa's house, and he would say, son, come here. He's always sitting on that same stupid couch. Remember that? And and, uh, ugly, ratty old couch, but it was his couch. But anyway, he would sit there, and he would have a Bible, and he would, come here, come here. And you'd go, yeah, okay, what, Grandpa? He'd come over there, and he'd say, look what I found. I've read this book 50 times. And I look what I just found. Isn't that cool? Read this. And he'd make us read it aloud. Love that old man. Great man of God. Great inspiration to us because he knew the word. You got to know the word. You got to be in the words. So you want the abundant life? You got to make Jesus the Lord of your life. You want the abundant life? You got to connect and invest with other believers. You want the abundant life? You got to have his light. You got to be in the word. You got to know it. Now, our uncle is a pastor. And he took up a challenge once, and he told me about it, and he threw the challenge at me. My uncle David can recite by memory one scripture from every single chapter in the entire Bible, 1,189. I dare you, if I bring him in here to speak, ask him, 
So what's in Nahum chapter 2? And he goes, well, chapter 2, verse 2 says this, because he has it like that. You want to know the word? There's a challenge for you. How about this? Some of you look at me and go, I, I can't do it. Listen, if you read three chapters of the Old Testament and one chapter in the New Testament every single day, seven days a week, you will read the entire Bible in nine months and four we- or three weeks. Nine months, three weeks. That's it. One year. You miss a few days. Read it. Go to our small groups and learn the depth of it. Show up here on a Sunday and I'll tell you what I found. Be a person of the word. The light is what you need. You want the abundant life? Here's the key. It's based on the revelation of the life principles from God that we can only find in the Bible. That's it. There it is. No other place. So, 1 John. John goes on. Here's the, here's the, the beloved, John the beloved. And he says, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie. And do not live by the truth. That's powerful. He's not pulling any punches here. Remember I said there's people in this room that call themselves Christians and you're not? It says, if you claim to have fellowship with him, you claim to be a Christian, yet you walk in the darkness, you're a liar. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to your wife. You're lying to your husband. You're lying to your friends. The one person you're not lying to is God because he sees right through you. But if, verse 7, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. Truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just. And he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, there are many people that say, well, you know, I heard that God is love. Again, I'm going to talk about that couple I was taught, that came into my office. And I ask them, you know, what are your spiritual beliefs? And they both, you know, well, you know, God is love. You're right. He is. But what does that mean to you? Well, it means that since God is love, it doesn't matter what I do. He loves me anyway. Oh, well, wait a minute. It does matter what you do. He does love you anyway, but it does matter what you do. I love my children. Does it matter what they do? You think? I love them enough to go, I'm going to whack you upside the head so hard, snot's going to fly three feet out of your head. Okay, I'm sorry. But I love you so much. I love you so much. It does matter what you do. Yes, God is love, but it does matter what you do. It does matter. Now, these same people will say, well, you know, everybody sins after all. And, and you know, if, as long as I'm doing what makes me happy, God really doesn't care. Because God wants me to be happy. How many of you know that's not true? It's not true. See, there are a lot of people that call themselves Christians, call themselves believers, call themselves religious or whatever else. But the character of their lives is directly in contradiction with the principles of what God says is holy. Does that make sense? God's light. God's direction. God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. He says, this is the way. Walk you in it. But so many of us call ourselves Christians and the character of our life is going this way. We say we are Christians, but we walk in darkness. We continue a lifestyle. The word walk in darkness, that's key because some people go, wow, it looks like you got to never sin. That's not what it says. If it said you got to never sin, it would say you got to never sin. It didn't say that. In fact, it says if you walk in the light and confess your sins, well, that implies something. What? You a sinner. (laughs) Okay? You're never going to beat it, right? You're never going to beat it. But walking in the light is... I get it. I'm never going to beat it. This is where I'm at today. Forgive me for this. Here's what John is trying to say. He's saying, you need to have a different life mentality. The whole world says, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Religious people really say, we are the good people and everybody else smells bad. 
We are not religious people here. We have a relationship with the living God. Very different thing. Do you see? Now, when we walk in a, a situation of what I call the repentant life, it's a life that is constantly and continually examining itself and going, the way I just spoke to my husband is disrespectful. And Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33 says, Wives, see to it that you respect your husband. I'm wrong. I repent. I repent before the Lord. I repent before him. It's a lifestyle that says, my wife is hurting and upset because of the way I treated her. She's saying she's feeling unloved. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, Husbands, see to it that you love your wife. I'm wrong. I repent before the Lord and before my wife. That's a repentant life. It's relentless. It's day in and day out. It's not, I prayed a prayer once and I'm good to go. It doesn't work that way, friends. you got to walk in the light. It says if you walk in the darkness, you're a liar. But if you walk in the light, you'll get purified. Do you see it? Let me say it again. If you walk in the darkness, you pretend you're a Christian and you just live any way you want to live and you just do all these things. You hide it. I mean, there are entire denominations out there that say, you know what, we're gay Christians. No, you're not. You're gay, not Christians. Because that is a lifestyle that is contrary to what God's Word says. <gasps> Can't believe you said something so unloving. No, I'm just telling you what God's Word says. You know, I could take it up with Him. Are you with me? You can't walk in the darkness. You cannot walk in the darkness. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says it this way. Do you not know that those who do wrong will have no share in the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, who are idol worshipers, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, abusers, swindlers, none of these will have a share in the kingdom of God. That pretty much covers it, don't you think? He's saying, look, people who say they are, a, they are a Christian and make no effort to end these kinds of behaviors in their lives, or worse, they try to pretend that these lifestyles are okay or even commended by God. Isn't that wild? There are people who try to twist the Scriptures and say that doesn't mean what it says. A real Christian is someone who makes up their mind, Jesus is Lord. I will have fellowship with others. I will be in the word. I will walk in the light. And if there are areas of my life that do not reflect the holiness and the light of God, I will work to see those areas defeated, to see me strong in that. And I will do it until my last breath. I will not give in to the excuse that I am old and it's too, you know, old dog, new tricks. No, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Old dog, lots of new tricks. I will not give in to the excuse that I'm young and I have a right to go off and play and have fun until I get old and then, then I'll be nice. No, uh, uh, no, 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 no. I walk in the light. And it's old, young, male, female, tall, short, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We walk in the light as he is in the light. Make sense? Are you with me? Now this is important. It's not saying that you can never sin. That's not what he's saying. Because there'd be no sin to cleanse if that was the way it was, right? It says, quit walking in the darkness, make up your mind, I'm going to walk in the light. And when you do, then you'll be purified of your sins. That's the key that we need to get. The abundant life bears with the challenge of a constant renewal. Constant. And when we get done with this, listen to me. We're, gonna, we're almost done here. Not quite, so the band's not going to jump yet. We're going to sing a worship song. And then I'm going to go over there under that cross where there's a carpeted area. Some of you need to pray. I'll pray for you. Some of you need to go, you know, I got, I'm not walking in the light. And I know it. I've been playing the game. We'll get there. Here we go. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and pure us, purify us from all unrighteousness. You know the beauty of that word purify? It says, now look what it says. Why does it say two things? Forgive our sins and purify. Why does it say that? Because there's a difference. Listen to me on this one because some of you this is going to set you free. 
You know, I walked for years believing Jesus has forgiven me from my sins. I'm going to heaven. But I walk around with this great big L on my forehead. Because I may be going to heaven, but I'm a loser. I've done all kinds of stupid things. They may not be sins, but they're just plain dumb. I was dumb enough to destroy a first marriage. Killed it. I was dumb enough to have two businesses go bankrupt underneath my feet. And I walked around with that L on my forehead until I read that. And I went, wait a minute. It says, purify us from all unrighteousness. That word unrighteousness means just plain stupid stuff. That's the Greek. (laughs) That's what it means. Did you know something about God? Didn't we just say something that God is love? Remember that part? Who's the object of his love? You are. You are. God loves you because God loves you. Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. He loves you. All the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's relentless like light. It just never stops. He's not going to love you anymore, by the way, today if you go and pray. He doesn't love you anymore when you become Billy Graham. He's not going to love, there's nothing you could do to make you, him love you any less either. God loves you, period. End of discussion. He hates sin. And if you don't give it up and walk in the light, his wrath will fall upon you. That is true, but his love will never stop. You know that God loves the people in hell today. He does. He longs for them. He wishes. He pleads. He gave them a life, and he said, I've given you everything to come and and accept my love because it's relentless and it never ends. But you know what? People reject him all the time. doesn't mean his love stops. And what God says is, if you walk in the light with me, not only will I forgive your sins before myself, but I'll purify you from all of the idiot stuff that you have done, and you can quit walking around with that L on your forehead. And you can give it up and go, I am the object of God's love. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am the bride of Christ. I am. Because he made me. Because he washed away my sins. This is not a pride thing. This is a humble thing. And I don't need to walk around with that weight on my shoulders of all the dumb things I've done. I should have married that one or I shouldn't have married this one. Whatever it happens to be, you don't have to live with that anymore. He'll purify you from all. Which part of that word all did you miss? Does that cover everything? Say yes. So it covers it all. Now, it says, what do you got to do to get that? What do you got to do to get that forgiveness and that purification? What's the key word there? Say it. Say it again. Say it louder. No, no, no. One more time. Get it. You know what the word confess means? Some of us think that confess means I got to get my list out and say, well, I did this and I did this and I did this and I did this and I did this. No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that. The word confess means to say the same as. Let me say it again. The word confess in Greek means to say the same as. In other words, when we confess our sins, we are willing to say and we are willing to believe the same thing about our sin that God says about it. It's not acceptable. Does that make sense? That's what confession is. See, Jesus tells a story to illustrate this. I'm going to just blast through this really quick. Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 18, verse 10, about a religious man who did all the right stuff and a sinner. And they both showed up to pray at the temple on the same day. And the religious man stands up and prays like this. Thank God that I do all the right stuff. Thank you, God, that I go to church. Thank you, God, that I'm not like uh, that tax collector over there. Thank you, God, for all of the wonderful things that I am. But the other man, Jesus said, stood at a distance. And you see in his heart, he finally agreed with what God was saying about his lifestyle. And he said, 
Woe is me. Have mercy on me, God. I'm a sinner. You see, he was the one that was justified because his confession was, I think the same way about my lifestyle choices as you do, God. That's confession. That's from your heart. That's what the Bible calls the circumcision of the heart. See, when we confess our sins, it's about understanding that God is light. That's what we're talking about. And you know, the, the funny part about that word confess, it's in the present tense. It's not in the past tense. It's not in the, the uh, English present perfect tense either, which means that you do it once, right? It means we keep on doing it. It's relentless, and that's the last key. That abundant life that you're looking for, it blooms, it grows when we really agree with God about our need to be continually transformed by Him. You don't arrive, guys. We have elders on this church board. The reason they're elders on this board, the reason I asked them to be, I didn't come up to him and go, um, well, he's not an elder right now, but he was. Okay, I didn't come up and say, Doug, you figured everything out, you do everything right, please be one of our elders. No, no, no. When Doug was an elder, I said, Doug, you're a man who understands how much you've been forgiven. You're a man who understands what it means to walk in a relentless, continuous transformation. Would you help us and oversee others to do the same? That's what an elder is. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? Elders, you should be listening. Now, let's sum it up. The abundant life is found in having that right foundation. We started with that, right? Recognize that Jesus is God. The next thing that we need to know is we've got to develop the right companions. Get those relationships with other believers. Thirdly, we need to follow the right source, the revelation from God that we find in His Word. And finally, we've got to have the right goal, a continuous transformation. That's where you find the abundant life.